Sound check. You guys can hear me because I can hear me. How about on Zoom? We can hear you. Loud and clear. All right. Awesome. First thing on the list of things to do today is to uh, go over the homework. So you should have the answers from part one. I'm gonna write them up here. And I want you guys to copy these down on another piece of paper and submit it with your homework. So you already probably pulled these up. If you already listed them on your homework, you're good. But I just wanna make sure that you have these with your homework and that we're all on the same page. So list and turn in what I'm writing right now. So these are the answers from problem one on part one of homework number three. So copy those and this is what you're adding together for this homework. And then these are the answers for the different areas and stuff like that. All right, so that's the starting point for this part two. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. So this is page one of what you turn in on Friday. Make sense? All right, so then we're calculating the airplane lift curve slope A, which depends on the wing body lift curve slope, the canard lift curve slope that we calculated here, the areas and the downwash. You guys caught up here, I'm gonna move over to another board. Still riding or are you guys good? I'm, you're, you are my model students for everybody, so. Good. I'm just saying, can you move to the left? Because I'm standing in the way, or well, there's a problem here if I'm like this. <laughs> All right, thanks for the heads up. Move to C numbers, got it. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to hear the Zoom people here. Somebody on Zoom say something. I'm good. Is anyone else good? Awesome. Yeah, I think we're good, good to go. Yeah, I apologize for that. that I haven't figured out how to get the audio to come in here from you guys. All right, so now we're good. I'm going to shift to another board. Okay. All 
All right, so now we're gonna calculate the lift curve slope. Make sure you show your work. Because that's what's gonna be graded. Does that match with what you guys are getting? Yep, let's plug and crank. And then you're gonna plug into the CM alpha equation and the CM zero equation over here. We're leaving IT. Somebody go over there because I'm pointing to it. So we're substituting next into this equation. And this equation, um, we're not, we don't have a number for this. We're leaving that as a variable. So you should get CM alpha is minus 1.170. And then CM zero bar. And it's bar because we're still working with LT rather than LT bar. There's that weird bar notation that he uses. And again, show your work. Show the equations with the numbers substituted in and then calculate the answer. Because that's what's gonna be graded, not the answer. Are we good here? Matching. And then let's see, you're supposed to calculate. So essentially we say, okay, we're gonna say that we're, we, if we know the neutral point, then that formula holds. And since we know H and we know A and we know CM alpha now, we can calculate the neutral point from this formula rather than the big giant formula. Doesn't save us any work because we still have to plug in to get this and then go into this formula. So H N And notice that this is a negative number, so this is in front of the wing um, root cord, because that's our datum. That's okay, because the CG is further in front of that. Remember the CG? out here and so the neutral point is here so even though we're doing this canard configuration CG is still in front of the neutral point if you plotted it on the figure but the real data is is this stable so make sure you answer that question so pitch table Okay, questions on that? That's problem number one, which is actually number three because it's continued from part one. Then we're gonna add the two formulas. Uh, we're gonna add CM0 and CM alpha to get the total pitching moment. Yeah, so that's easy. You're just adding those two formulas. So show your work. And then you're gonna use the formula to convert alpha to alpha wing body. Uh, 
Uh, we derive that formula. I give it to you again, don't I? Yeah. So you're just plugging numbers into that formula, and that tells you this is how alpha and alpha wing body are related to each other. Notice it depends upon the canard setting angle. And that's because this thing affects CM0. And then you're going to substitute this in for alpha in the summation formula. Right, you've added these two things together. Well, oh, sorry, this has to be multiplied by alpha there. My mistake. You're going to substitute this in up here, and then you can get a formula for CM. Oh, scratch that. We're converting. Sorry about that. Of alpha wing body, so you're substituting there to get this in terms of alpha. So show that work as well. I got a head there. So again, you're going to calculate this thing, show your work on that, show your work on adding these things together, show the work and substituting that up there to get the total here in terms of alpha. Now this is some function of alpha, so don't get confused. It's not equal to alpha. It's equal to all that stuff that you're going to put in there. So all this is just algebra. Add the two together, algebra. Calculate this, plug in numbers, substitute algebra, and you're done. We're good. Any questions? When is this due by? It says on the sheet, doesn't it? Friday, 1020 AM, Central Daylight Time. Have you heard they're talking about getting rid of daylight savings time? Actually keeping daylight savings time, I think, all year long. Which sounds great, except in December, early December, it's going to be dark when everybody gets up. You're what? In other words, we shouldn't switch during the summer is what you're saying. Yeah. When I was in high school, we had daylight saving time all year long because of the energy crisis. And it was dark in the winter when you got up. My personal opinion is we should just all live in Hawaii or the days are the same every day. I guess that'd get kind of boring though, right? It'd never snow. Like the sun comes up about 6.30 and goes down about 6.30 or 7 every day and it's nice. You'll trim the airplane with IT, or sorry, IC, the tail setting angle. So we'll tilt the canard up and down to trim the airplane. No elevator. That's problem number one. And that's really easy because the pitching moment and the lift equations are decoupled. In other words, you can solve for alpha and then solve for IC. Whereas with the elevator, we had the two equations and two unknowns, right? So the first problem on the new homework is to trim with IC. The second one is to trim with elevator. So you'll be doing the two by two solution. And that's why I had you go through this with me in class. So it's exactly the same thing that you'll be doing for the canard airplane. Um, when the elevator is added to the airplane and then attached to uh, the stick, or if you use an all moving tail or canard, then there's forces on the stick resulting from the elevator being deflected. I'm over here, right? Okay. So here we have the wing. Here's the tail. If we deflect the elevator downward like this, there's a mechanical linkage that goes up to the pilot, to the stick. And because the elevator is deflected down like that, the air is hitting the elevator, right? 
And so it's going to want to push the elevator. There's a moment generated about the hinge. It's going to want to push the elevator back up. And the pilot has to maintain a force. Yeah, and he's going to be pushing the stick forward to make it do that, right? To go nose down. So he's got to have a force on here to keep the airplane flying. For a small airplane, the force is not very high. For a big airplane, it could be a high force, although you can put some mechanics in there to, to change the force. But if you're having to hold the elevator at that position for a long period of time, even for like 10 minutes for a landing, it gets difficult. It's just a, a lot of force or even a small amount of force over a long time, you get tired of doing that. And so people invented what's called an elevator trim tab. To help with that. And so the trim tab is a is a, another movable surface near the end. And so in this case, we could move the trim tab up like that. And then it will generate a hinge moment in the opposite direction. And it has a longer moment arm. So it's out near the tip. And so it can counteract the moment. Well, I've already got it drawn up here, the moment due to the elevator deflection. And delta T is the trim tab deflection. And we'll define all that in a minute. But this is the talk through as to why the trim tab is even there. So the pilot can take off and then have to be holding the stick in a certain position. And then there's a trim wheel or some other kind of device that they move, adjust the trim tab until they feel no force on the stick. And it makes it easier to fly. In fact, uh, if you're an experienced pilot and you learn properly how to take off and land, you'll know where to put the trim tab. <clears throat> Even before you take off, you'll put it in a takeoff setting so that when you get in the air, there's not all this force that you have to deal with. And in fact, you can fly the airplane with the trim tab. It's just not as easy. There's a lag. So we're going to define the terms with regard to, well, what's the size of the tab and how do you get the effects of the tab on the lift and pitching moment of the airplane. Just like we did for the elevator, right? The elevator creates a lift and a pitching moment. So now we have to add in this thing. You'll find that's the case with everything that you do with airplanes is whenever you add an extra thing, then you have to calculate all the aerodynamic forces and moments because of that extra thing. And then you have to see, well, how does it affect the pitch trim and how does it affect the pitch stability of the airplane? You put a missile on the bottom of the wing. You got to go back and calculate everything again, adding that effect in and see how it changes everything for the airplane. So this is done on a horizontal tail or a canard, and it's added the trim tab to the elevator. So draw this picture big. I'm going to define the terms. This is the horizontal tail. And then here's the elevator, like that. There's the hinge. So draw a dotted line through that. <clears throat> and in the book, they even put a little gap here so that it's obvious that, that it's not solid, that it can rotate. And then the trim tab, same deal here. There's a hinge for that and that it sticks down out that way. And so this is the tab hinge. The cord of the tail is just the mean aerodynamic cord of the whole thing. 
And then the, this is called the chord of the elevator. And it's the average chord of the elevator, right? The elevator could get smaller and bigger as you go across the wing, the span of the tail. And then the hinge moment is called HE. And we're going to list all these things and define them. So I'm going to do that over here. <coughs> HE is the elevator hinge moment, which just means the moment of the forces on the elevator taken about this point. So all of the aerodynamic distributed load, top and bottom surface here, moment arms times the moment arm relative to this point here, and it gives you the total hinge moment. Delta E, we already know, but that's the elevator deflection angle. And which way is positive? Should be able to draw this and know this. Which way is positive on elevator? Up or down? Down, right? Positive down by convention. Delta T is the trim, tab, deflection, angle, and it's positive down. So positive elevator and positive trim tab produce positive lift total on the airplane. Let's see what else we got. So CT, CT bar is the mean aerodynamic cord of the tail. SE is the area of the elevator aft of the hinge. CE is the mean chord of the elevator. After the hinge. And we're ready to delta T. So this is all just geometry and distances. Again, it's the anatomy, and now we're talking about the anatomy of the tail and the elevator and the hinge and the tab. And the last thing we're going to define is what's called the elevator hinge moment coefficient. And I'm going to write that over here. I guess I could write it up here. Let me erase. So add this on. It's called C for coefficient, H for hinge, E for elevator. And it's the hinge moment divided by, what do you think we're going to divide it by? We want to divide it by stuff that, that the hinge moment depends on. So what do we divide CL by? Or better, that CM of the airplane. We take the total pitching moment, we divide by dynamic pressure, right? Because the dynamic pressure, more dynamic pressure, the more force, the more moment. We divide by the S of the airplane because it's the total airplane. And we divide by C bar because that's a characteristic longitudinal dimension. All right, so the hinge moment is going to depend upon Q infinity, right? Dynamic pressure. Tail. What area should we use? And again, we're just talking about the hinge moment right now. So what area here 
do you think is most correlated to the hinge moment? So which one? The elevator, that makes sense, right? We wouldn't want to use the area of the whole tail because it's less correlated. We wouldn't want to choose the floor area of the cockpit because it's totally irrelevant, right? So we'll use ST, I'm oh, sorry, SE. And then what kind of dimension would we use? Cord, we could use the cord of the tail, but more correlated is the cord of the elevator, right? Because it's those kind of moment arms in back here that determine this hinge moment. By the time you graduate, you're gonna be wanting to, I mean, everything is done in terms of coefficients, right? So who knows, you'll be creating your own coefficients like your bank account balance coefficient non-dimensionalized by your income or something, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh, yes, yeah. And you can see why we have to do like the, the average cord. Are you guys close to finishing with that board? That if I shifted, if it went away, you'd still be good? You can see why you have to use the average cord because who knows, maybe the horizontal tail looks like this. And then the elevator looks like that. So there's a larger cord here than there is here. All right, so like I said, we need to come up with models, math models for how do we predict this based on all this stuff. Um, and so the math model for CHE I put a cap, no, it's lowercase, okay. And we will like math models because if we have math models, then we can calculate. So we come up with a math model that approximates the actual forces on the airplane. So there's actually two versions. We have one that depends on the angle of attack of the tail, the elevator deflection and the trim tab. Because those are the variables that are gonna affect what this hinge moment is. If the V infinity is coming in and an angle of attack like that, it's gonna change the hinge moment than if it's coming in like this. And we have to use the angle of attack of the tail because it could be affected by the downwash of the wing up here, right? and whether the tail is tilted up or down, just like anything else. Obviously, if you deflect the elevator, it changes the hinge moment. If you deflect the trim tab, it changes the hinge moment, because that's why we put it there. And then the other version, which we want to get to is in terms of alpha, because that's usually what we're talking about for the whole airplane and then still delta E and delta T. So the difference between the two models is whether you use the local angle of attack or you use the angle of attack of the airplane. Just like in the pitching moment models for the whole airplane, we either do it in terms of alpha wing body or alpha. So the formulas look like this. So the first one, there could be a constant hinge moment. There's gonna be a hinge moment due to alpha T and B1 is a constant that we're gonna to have to look up. And then B2 multiplies elevator and B3 multiplies trim tab. And these are linear models because their equations are straight lines, right? 
uh, this is the B, y, y equals MX plus B. This is the slope relative to alpha. This is the slope relative to elevator. This is the slope relative to trim tab. So if you plotted it versus trim tab, you'd get this slope if you measured the slope. And then this is just the intercept. I mean, it's entirely possible that if you really wanted to model it accurately, you might have to include some squared terms or some cube terms or some sines and cosines. But typically the linear model works well as long as we're not stalled and we don't, you're not stalling the elevator, you're not stalling the tail. So typically we use just a linear model that's good for most flight conditions. All right, and then the other one looks like this. And this is in terms of alpha. And these things, B0, B1, B2, and B3, come from data charts in your book, appendix B.3, page 322. And in the homework that you'll be starting on right now, you're, you can do problems one and two if you wanna start on them tonight, tomorrow. Um, after Friday, you'll be able to work on problem number three, which is a trim tab problem. But all this stuff comes from the charts and that's problem number three is looking up some of this data for our airplane. Do you love the notation here? Here we got C coefficient. H stands for what? Hinge moment, right? It's the hinge moment coefficient. What does E stand for? Yeah, so it's the hinge moment of the elevator. So far, so good. So all this is the coefficient. I mean, we could name this Henry, but then you go, what? Okay, I need to remember what Henry is, right? Then what do we got left on that? Then it's another subscript delta E, so what does that mean? It means it's the slope of the elevator hinge moment coefficient with respect to elevator. It's the thing that multiplies elevator. Just like C subscript L subscript alpha is the slope of the CL alpha curve. This is the slope of the CHE versus elevator curve. So it's just that number that multiplies the elevator in our formula, so it's the slope. And it's notated so that you can look at it and you know immediately what it is. Yeah. Two. Oh, that's, let me shift over there so the zoomers can see it. You're talking about this? Yeah. This is the definition of this thing. And so those formulas are predicting this. And then if you wanted to get the actual hinge moment, you multiply this thing by this stuff to get the actual foot pounds. How are we doing on time and what's next? 11.10. All right, so I told you how to get B0, B1, B2, and B3. They come from this, the charts here. So how do you get these? And what it amounts to is taking that top linear model 
and then we need to get this in terms of alpha. And so we're going to get the second model data from the first model. In other words, we've got to find out what CHE alpha is. Um, and so what you do is alpha tail is alpha wing body minus IT tail minus epsilon zero minus D epsilon D alpha alpha wing body, right? That's the angle of attack of the tail. It's the wing body angle of attack and then the tail could be tilted down and then you got the downwash. So we've done that before, right? And then we've got to get this in terms of alpha, so we have to use our conversion formula to that. And I need to make a comment here. So this is for a horizontal tail. Can you guys see that okay? Canard, for a canard, there's gonna be a plus sign here, a plus sign here, and a plus sign here. Because the canard has upwash, remember that? And then the positive angle is positive up. So for canard, this formula has this, and there's a plus sign there for canard. So you put everything together, substitute in there, and I'm not gonna go through the algebra, I'm gonna give you the formulas, and they're in the book as well. So if you do all that substitution, you get C H E zero is B zero minus B one and then C H E alpha is B1, that stuff, and then the rest is easy. CHE delta E is just B2, and CHE delta T, because they don't involve alpha, is B3. And these equations are in the book, 2.5 comma 4. Page 43. And again, they're not magical. We just take this model and we have this data in the back of the book for a generic flying surface with an elevator and a trim tab. And then we make it the airplane by converting it to alpha for the airplane. And for the canard, because of the sign changes, we get these signs. So for the canard, we get a plus sign here. That stays the same, but we get a plus here, and we get a plus here. And so that's the, those are the formulas you'll be using for your canard airplane. So an issue that we'll talk about next time is what we call free versus fixed elevator 
or stick fixed versus stick free. A fixed elevator or stick fixed would be when the pilot is originally holding the stick and by mechanical linkage the elevator in a really rigid fixed position. So why wouldn't he be doing that? If we have the trim tab and we take away all the force on the stick, he may actually lightly hold the stick instead of rigidly hold it. And so if a gust comes along, the gust may blow the elevator and the trim tab to a different position and the stick will move because he's lightly holding on to it. And so that changes the stability of the airplane, right? Because the gust can push on the elevator and push it to a non-trim condition. Whereas with a stick fixed, it's rigidly there. So we'll actually need to analyze both stick fixed, which we've already done, and the stick free stability of the airplane. Um, a way to think about this is if you're driving down the interstate, you got your cruise control on, right? You can kind of let go of the steering wheel. Um, it's going fine, but if you hit a giant bump, it will hit the tire, the tire will hit the bump, and it could throw the tire to the side, right? If you're not holding onto the steering wheel tightly, it will cause the car to veer off because of that disturbance on what's controlling the, the car. So it's the same kind of thing, is that you would want to analyze the stability of your car to maintain a track, both with a rigid hand on the steering wheel and with a light hand. Some cars, like my wife's new CRV Honda, has lane keeping. Anybody have a car with that in it? Yeah, you do. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, we turn it off too. Uh, it works, but it's not real great. And if it loses track of the lines on the road, then it doesn't know where to go. Um, and it's constantly, if you put it on and you let go of the wheel, after about two seconds, it beeps at you and says, steering required. Because it wants to make sure you're paying attention and you're actually driving the car because otherwise they're liable if you crash into something. So it's not completely self-driving. It's kind of nice on the interstate because it avoids a lot of correction, but then sometimes you end up fighting it. Word on the street is that self-driving cars are coming soon, but then you keep hearing that. And then one drives through a city in Arizona and hits somebody and then they were set back a couple of years. That's actually a hard problem and it shows you how intelligent humans are at doing the vision recognition, pattern recognition, learning, and then how to drive the car just to, to process all of that visual input needed to keep the car going where it needs to go. Yeah, so then we get self-driving cars and then there'll be the issue of somebody could hack into your car, right? I'm sure you've heard of that. You're driving down the road, somebody hacks into your car and crashes you. <clears throat> In fact, that's the plot line of a show we started watching. Have you seen it called Uploads or Uploaders? I think that's the name of it. Uh, a guy is in a self-driving car in the future um, and it turns out that he's gotten crossways with the company that makes the cars because he's formed a startup. I think I've got the plot right. And so they deliberately crash his self-driving car to kill him, to take him out. It's an interesting plot line. And then the plot line is that his consciousness gets uploaded into this virtual world and he lives there because you can pay money to do that. We watched about six episodes and I think it ended and we, they haven't come back to it. All right, well, we're done for today. <clears throat> See you on Friday for the quiz and then lecture. Make sure you finish up your homework. These two homework sets shouldn't have been too detailed. It's pretty straightforward, plugging and cranking numbers. Dr. Stack.
Dr. Speck? 